Welcome to Beyond the Reiki Gateway, a podcast reserved for the spiritually curious. Journey further with Reiki Masters Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy through in-depth conversations, many featuring inspiring and intriguing special guests to enrich your unique spiritual progression. Hi, everyone. We're excited to bring you another episode of Beyond the Reiki Gateway. This is Kathleen, and I'm here with my co-host, Andrea Kennedy. Today, we'll be doing something a little bit different. We'll be going back to our Reiki roots, if you will. We're going to be discussing a topic that we've received questions about. We've heard from some of our listeners. We've heard from friends. And people have been asking us about intuition and Reiki or psychic Reiki and how one's intuition and psychic abilities develop during Reiki or if they do and how they do. So Andrea and I decided that we would tackle this topic today and hopefully shed some light on that and perhaps share some techniques and tips that have helped us on our way. Sounds great, Kathleen. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. And wow, there's a lot of different places we could start with this, but I think maybe I just want to jump in right off the bat and say, yes, Reiki helps us develop our intuition. Absolutely. Definitely. Not only is that true in my own story, but I see that with my students all the time, all the time. And I'm just going to jump in here with a quick little story. One of my students comes to mind when we started our class. It was an online Reiki class. And she came into the class and said she wanted to be intuitive. You know, like she heard me being, you know, like on YouTube or whatever. I talked about it. And she said, I want to have that, but I've got nothing. I've got nothing. And I said, okay, sure. That's great. And we went on with the class. It was a three-day class. It was a master class. I'm not kidding. By the end of day two, they did a practice session and her partner's deceased grandmother visited. This woman delivered a message to her partner and it was all accurate and checked out. And so she went from, I can't do this at all, to that. (laughs) In one day. day. So- If anybody doubt if Reiki helps open us up intuitively, oh, you know, if that story doesn't do it, I don't know what does. But that is a pretty dramatic example of that. But what I would say is I do see it over and over in the classes. And I'm interested in hearing from you, Kathleen. What have you seen with your students? But maybe we can start back at our beginnings and what we noticed because I know I really didn't think I had any intuition back then either. Tell us about you, Kathleen. Okay, sure. And that that story about your student, my goodness, talk about going zero to 60. Yeah, I know. More like 120, I think. But (laughs) she must have been thrilled. That's all I can say. Yeah, we really enjoyed hearing that story from her. Okay, yeah, that was a great way to start off this episode for sure. And I'm glad you brought up our beginnings and how this all unfolded for us, because I think that's important to share too, because we all started at some point. We didn't end up here where we are now, just like drop from the sky. We all had a start. I remember thinking that I wasn't very intuitive when I first had Reiki, and I had already had, I would say, quite a bit of spiritual training and other modalities and just areas of interest. So it wasn't like I was new to this. But I have to say, when I went to my first Reiki class, I felt kind of, I don't know about this. I was skeptical. You know, I'm hearing all these people talk about seeing white tigers and all these visions. And I'm like, (laughs) uh, no. But anyway. White tigers. Okay. I I really felt like I was just so behind the curve with this one student in class. But she was really, really like intuitive. So anyway. At the end of the day, though, I could just feel the difference. And this was in Reiki 1. And then at Reiki 2 is when it really, really started to ramp up. And I imagine you can relate to that because 
when we teach Reiki, we tell our students that that is when you can really feel the difference that the intuition really begins to develop and grow. And that's what I always told my students, you know, this is what happens. And that's what I noticed in myself. And I know my students have told me the same thing with Reiki too. But then going to the master level, wow, even more so. But you have to start somewhere. And what comes into my mind is patience. We have to be patient and we have to do the work and we have to create and develop a relationship with the energy. It doesn't just be okay to say, oh, I have Reiki and hope everything just kind of blossoms from there. You have to work with the energy and you have to develop a relationship. And that's where I think a lot of people fail to understand how this truly works. And I'd love to get your take on it. What do you think of that? Yeah, I agree with you. And what I would say is, number one, we all have the capacity for that extrasensory perception is what I'm going to call it. It's just really perceiving in quote unquote extra ways, sensing in extra ways, not just our regular five senses. So whatever that means to you, that's really what we're talking about, that extra information. But what I would say is, for me, I think the change agent, I think is what I want to say, is practice. And what I mean by practice is you're in the flow of Reiki energy. You're being the channel. So you could be a channel for yourself doing self-Reiki, or you could be a channel for other people, which adds a whole nother layer of the experiential part of Reiki to have that third energy. You've got Reiki, you've got you, and then you've got another energy, which I think helps add a contrast to the time in the flow of Reiki, which can help different things stand out to us. When we're just working with ourselves, we're so used to ourselves. I guess I want to back up a second and say there's no substitute for the time a practitioner spends in the flow of Reiki. You cannot go buy it. (laughs) You can't substitute it. In order to develop the relationship, as you said, with Reiki, you've just got to spend time in the flow of the energy. So self-practice is wonderful, but there's also such an added depth to your relationship with the energy when you offer it to someone else, you know, and animals and all of that as well, of course, but you just have to be in the flow. And I will tell you, I have received so much inspiration, the best ideas when I'm in the flow of the energy. And that is, I think, because from my perspective, when we're channeling that energy, it's very meditative. And when we're in a meditative state, the mind is quiet and we can, I guess I'll just say, can hear that pin drop. We're not distracted. We're not running around doing things. And, and, you know, the universe can have more of a conversation with us at that time because we aren't distracted with everyday life. And that's really putting it simply, I think. But I think you're absolutely right. It isn't just about the attunement, which I do think is very helpful in opening us up to our intuition, to our clear senses. So I don't want to say that that isn't an important part of it, but it's just one part. So if we are looking to develop those skills, it isn't just about receiving the attunement. It's about the practice and being in the flow of the energy. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Being in the flow of the energy is a really good way to put that. And the attunement, it opens us up. That's just the beginning, though. It's then up to us. What do we do with this newfound ability? What do we do with it? Where do we go from there? And that is what will define what happens. You know, what do we want to do? And everybody approaches it differently. But what I've noticed with myself and other students, quite a few students, actually, is we want it to happen like 
like this. Snap the fingers and it, okay, I'm intuitive. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And you know that. And I think everybody really does know that, but you're thinking like, oh, maybe this time it'll be that way. No. So you do have to practice. And being in the flow of the energy doesn't just mean practicing Reiki on yourself or others or animals. It also means making it a part of your life inviting it into your daily life. And I talk about this a lot, probably to the point that people are going, oh, yada, 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 here we go. But to me, it's super important because that's what helps us create that relationship I mentioned earlier. Because we all do self-Reiki. Anybody who's serious about practicing Reiki does self-Reiki. It's a must. I think for practicing Reiki people, it's the gold standard. You have to do it. And because it does help you to forge a deeper relationship with the energy and it and it helps to develop those intuitive abilities. But even more than that, I mean, even when we work with our people, we're not doing that all the time, obviously. We can't. So as we invite it into our daily lives, that way we are in the flow of energy a lot, most of our waking hours. And for me, I always invite Reiki in before I go to sleep to flow through me and help me while I sleep for as long as it's valuable. I'm constantly in the flow and it makes a huge difference. Being in the flow is not limited to just practicing on yourself or others. It just means being with the energy and allowing it to be with you. That's how I see it. And that's what really allows those abilities to flourish because then you're starting to realize wow, did that just happen? And you start to notice these things about yourself and the world that you didn't before, and you realize that you're, you're on your way. I think so far, we've been a little bit general, maybe with what we're talking about. And I'd like to get a little bit more specific with what we mean as far as intuitive Reiki or psychic Reiki. I guess what I mean by that is in my example of that one student what was that? Well, that was mediumship. I mean, you talk about like, woo, the floodgates open for her, but apparently she was ready for that or else, of right. course, that mm -hmm. would not have happened. But I want to talk a little bit about in the scope of this conversation, what do we mean by psychic Reiki in a session? Uh, what does that mean? And I guess we could give some examples. You want to do that? Sure. You and I both have examples. <laughs> I have no doubt of that. Well, one of the things I'll say is going way back, when I first learned Reiki, I didn't really understand that much. To be honest, I, I didn't really get it. And most people know I came to this from the mainstream background and all that. I was very skeptical. And I wasn't really looking for Reiki. And so when I first learned Reiki, I just thought, oh, okay, some hand positions and you're supposed to relax or something like this. So my Reiki one was very, very basic. And then as I did keep an interest in it and I went a little further with it, I still didn't understand that Usui was intuitive. His whole sessions were driven intuitively, right? With the Japanese Reiki techniques like Byosen scanning or Reiji Ho. And there wasn't the, I'm going to call it the recipe approach of the foundation treatment until much later in Reiki. I have to say, and we've said it before, I know I have at least on the podcast, Kathleen, that I needed the step one, the step two, the step three, and I needed to hold on to that. And that's how I started. And it wasn't really until years later that I could really see and embrace the spectrum of practice. Usui, very intuitive. And then Mrs. Takata with the steps approach of the, the foundation treatment of hand positions. And it was then, it was like the blinders came off and I realized, oh, it's okay to be intuitive with Reiki. It's okay to see spirit guides. It's okay to get messages. I guess, for my person, because I fought that. I thought Reiki is the energy and that's it. And so I was starting to receive messages. 
I was starting to see things for the people that I was sharing Reiki with, but I resisted because I thought that's not Reiki, that's something else. It wasn't until later it finally dawned on me, oh, this is a part of Reiki. (laughs) And then I allowed myself to ease up and invite it in more. And then though, we do get a whole nother uh, set. I'm going to say, at least for me, I got a whole nother set of questions about, oh, well, what's appropriate and all of that. But Right. I kind of veered off. We were going to give some examples and then look at me. I went <laughs> I went out in the weeds a little bit. That's okay. I we'll want to there. say something first. Okay. Because what you just described about yourself is what one of the first things that you said about yourself when we first met and we were doing the Facebook things, remember? Uh-huh. <laughs> you proudly identified yourself <laughs> as a Reiki purist. Yes. And I was thinking, what is what is that? <laughs> You know? Yeah, and, but you just described it. You were mm-hmm. just all about the foundational treatment, the hand positions. You probably were very conscious of the amount of time you spent in each position, all those. Oh, right. Well, I will say not really. I, I didn't have a timer or anything like okay. that. But you know what? Let me just clarify. Wow. Those Facebook things we did, that seems like it was 27 years ago. Okay. It was only but, four. Uh, I, it's crazy. Anyway, so what I'll say, though, is when I say Reiki purist, what I felt like was Reiki is spiritually guided, life force energy, period, the end. And so to me, a Reiki treatment was that, just the energy, that's it. Right. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Yeah. Nothing else. None of this intuitive nonsense. What are you talking about? (laughs) But, you know, in fairness, when we met and we did that, oh, I was giving messages to people and all of that. But that's where that comes from. I remember because that really stuck with me. I That was the first time I'd ever heard and the last time I ever heard the term (laughs) Reiki purist. But then when we got to know each other a little better, I realized that you were receiving messages. You were passing those along to your clients and all, but you still, I think, thought of yourself as more in that space of this is the energy and this is what I'm working with. And if stuff comes in, oh, that's great. But going back to the Reiki. That is a separate thing still. My advice, you know, I guess I'll put it out there since we're talking about it. And I think you agree with this too, Kathleen, is if we're a practitioner that does receive information And that kind of thing, if that's how we work, if that's how we have our sessions go, I would encourage practitioners to put that up front to our clients and ask them if that's okay. Yes. And make sure that we give our client a first right of refusal because they may, the client may think that it's just the energy and that's it. And we don't want to unknowingly cross a boundary there as the practitioner. So I like to say Reiki is this and oh yes. And by the way, I often can see and feel and receive information about what's going on with your energy. And uh, would you like me to share that with you at the end of the session or, you know, something like that, just so that they know, so that I know that we're on the same page and in agreement before. I think that's super important, Andrea. And I do the same thing because like you said, you don't want to cross a boundary and I sure don't want to scare anybody or freak anyone out. I pretty much do with the way you just described. Yeah. Sometimes I get information or impressions or messages. And is it okay if I share those with you? I don't think I've had anyone turn me down. I trying to remember most people are, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, But I still like to put it out there because I think, like you said, it shows a respect and a consideration for their well-being, truly. Yeah, I agree. Glad you brought that up. I know you started out as a Reiki purist, and here you are now inviting all other things in, and I think it's great. But I think it also goes to show just how Reiki evolves with us, right? Yeah. I know your sessions, let's call them that look very different than they did when you first started. Oh, yes. So do mine. I mean, they are probably almost unrecognizable from when I first started. But that's a good thing. uh, Because it shows that we along with the energy 
we're growing together, we're evolving together, we're developing together. I think that's wonderful because I know I have a very strong and deep relationship with Reiki, as I know you do too. It continues to grow and develop and get stronger. But I just when I started out, I was not really where you were as a Reiki purist. I really wanted that intuitive piece. That was something that I really wanted. But then <laughs> when it started coming in, it kind of freaked me out. Oh. And I'm like, yeah, what is this? Okay. You know, what happened? What happened? You have to tell us now. <laughs> you know, I'd be working with the client and it started, I would say, after I started doing client work, maybe at the, toward the end of the first year, maybe after several months or so. And I would get these little like hits and stuff would come into my head. Like you need to pay attention to the sacral chakra, or you may want to look at the left shoulder, things like that. And I'm thinking, what is that? And then it's funny as I'm talking about it, I'm getting like body chills because I remember how I felt. And I'm looking at this person lying on the table and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, am I making this stuff up? That was my main concern, that I was just sort of making it all up so that I'd have something to tell them. (laughs) Oh, But no, it was not that. And it took me a while to get past that. And I mean, I told them anyway, but then what happened was I did tell them because for me, I look at it this way. It's their information. It's their session. They're there receiving a Reiki session. If I get information, that's for them, not for me. So I would not keep that to myself. If they had given me permission to share things with them, I'm going to share it with them and Mm -hmm. see what happens. So what happened was I would share things. And more often than not, like almost all the time, they would be like, oh, my goodness, you know, that makes so much sense. And it really resonated and it landed. And I was like, oh, wow, I guess I'm not making this stuff up. Of course, I didn't say that out loud. And if anybody's listening who had a session with me back then, they're thinking, oh, my God, what was I doing? (laughs) (laughs) And I apologize, folks. We all have to learn. It's all about learning. (laughs) Right, right. That's how it was with me. I was kind of afraid of it at first because I didn't trust the energy. I wasn't there yet. But as time went on and I started getting that validation and the confirmation And I became more comfortable with the energy and I continued to work with it in many different ways. I relaxed into it. And then I was not in fear and I trusted it. I began to trust the energy and knew that it was giving me information that was in the best interest and the highest good of my client. And I carry that with me today and it is rock solid at this point. Yeah. Ready to skyrocket your spiritual growth in 2023? Archangel Metatron's magical 21-day meditation challenge will help you learn to have two-way dialogues with your angels, opening the doors to possibilities beyond your wildest dreams. Yes, you can channel angels. They will inspire, uplift, share healing energy, and more. You'll be amazed at how your life will transform with the support of your angels. Head over to DebraLupien.com forward slash 21 now for all the details, and you can find a link to that site in our show notes. I'd like to know, Kathleen, in the example that you just gave, but maybe even to today, how do you typically receive your information? Are you hearing a voice? Are you seeing things? Can you describe that for us? And it's funny you asked me that because I was Mm -hmm. thinking about this last night that I was considering this conversation today. And I thought, I think Andrea was going to ask me that question. (laughs) Oh, well, how psychic (laughs) of you. (laughs) I know how, how very psychic of you. For me, I often hear, and it's not like I hear different voices. It's actually, I can hear it in my head. I'm not hearing it out loud. I can tell it's not my thoughts just has a different feel. I'm I'm able to separate my thoughts from others. And so it's a lot of that the clear audience is what you know that is clear audience. Mm-hmm. And also clear cognizance. It's that sense you just know. Yep. Right? You just know without any earthly reason to know. Right. You just know. 
So that for me, those are the two big ones, I think. And clairsentience, the feeling, just that feeling. But that goes hand in hand with claircognizance. They're, they're very closely related, at least for me. Occasionally, I will see something, but not always. And if I do, it's in my mind's eye. Sometimes and rarely, I will see something like actually in the space. So for me, I would say my strongest ones are clairaudience, claircognizance, and clairsentience. What about you? Oh, that's interesting. Well, I think the knowing. Mm -hmm. I just never concentrated enough to learn all the little names. So you'll have to help help me out. <laughs> so the knowing, so that's Claire Cognizance. Cognizance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a knowing for absolute sure. And also I'm gonna say, and this is probably Claire sentience, but maybe you can help me understand that too. In my body, it's like a barometer and I just feel a resonance or a dissonance. So that's clairsentience, right? That's clairsentience the way I understand it. Yes. And I'm the same way. It's either like a yay or a nay in my body. Yeah. But I will say I am quite visual, but I think in the beginning, what happened a lot for me was I did get some visuals in my mind's eye at the beginning and I would get words or phrases just sort of appearing in my mind just appearing. And it mm -hmm. wasn't like a voice, but it was, again, that knowing. I knew it wasn't me because I didn't have a thought trail. When it's our own thinking that maybe this will help some of our listeners, when it's our own thinking, we can trace our thought pattern back. But when it's just intuitive, when it comes in, there's no trail. There's no thought trail there. It's just there. Also, what I'll say is because I think one of the big things for people is the trusting it. You know, oh, how do you yeah. trust it? Because it's all kind of coming through you, like you mentioned, the separation of it. And people will often ask, well, how do I know it's not me or whatever? You know, there comes a time and, and maybe with the repetition where you finally just, you got to either go with it or not. You have to either trust it or not. And what I found too was the trusting it, success leads to more success. Trusting it leads to that you're better able to trust it. A flow starts, just like the relationship with the Reiki energy, a relationship with the guidance happens. Exactly. Yeah. So I think in the early days, for me though, it, something weird would happen. I would get almost like a it's hard to describe like a, a little bubble, like this bubble of information, like a package. And I knew, oh, here's something. And it was almost like I had to inquire and, and ask questions like, okay, well, what is this? And then I would get different bits of information one after the other, but it would all kind of come in like a bubble and I'd have to unpack it. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense, but it does. That's so interesting. I don't experience that, but that's really fascinating. Yeah, it just was strange. But right at the beginning, though, I would get visuals, but a lot of it was symbolic. So if I was working with somebody, one instance comes to mind that there was a figure at the foot of the table and it was a, a person made of ash, just ashes. and. I wasn't afraid or anything like that. And it was in my mind's eye. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it with my actual eyes, but it was symbolic. It was actually symbolic of a relationship that completely was burned to the ground, basically, with mm -hmm. my client and a best friend of hers for many, many years. That relationship ended and it was symbolized with that figure in Ash. For me, the symbols, it takes a lot of questioning. And that's something else that I tell people a lot is ask if you see something or feel something, ask because the energy is present there. So ask the question and then be receptive for the answer. And that's how you learn the language of your own intuition and how you're receiving. That's true. I don't get the bubble of stuff anymore. It's much more direct 
And I do actually see, I actually see things sometimes with my eyes open. And that's a real trip. Yeah, it is. I know in the times that that's happened to me, it's a little unnerving to tell you the truth. I'm used to seeing things with my mind's eye. But when you actually see them, you know, blink a few times, (laughs) go, oh, oh, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now what? I know. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I remember the first time that ever really happened to me that I really remember. I want to share this because if anybody's wondering, well, how will I know or what do I look for and things like this, maybe that would be helpful. But I was in a session with a gentleman and he had this t-shirt on and it was kind of this blue gray color, but it was pretty dark. And I just was offering Reiki and I was kind of around where his liver is or something. And my hands were floating above his t-shirt. I wasn't touching him. And I was just kind of zoning out, you know, just in the flow of Reiki Right. And as you do, my eyes weren't really focused on anything, but I was kind of just looking past my hands. And all of a sudden, I realized that the area around my hands, and again, I wasn't looking directly there, it was kind of in the edge of my view, that the color around my hands was different than the shirt. And I thought, what is that? And I didn't look directly. I thought, what is that? And I kept looking where I had been looking so I could ask some questions and explore this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what it was, the the color of his shirt was super saturated around where my hands were, if that makes sense. So it was just really saturated around my hands, still the color of his shirt, but really vibrant, really, really bright. I thought to myself, what is going on? And then I thought, well, this is just a visual trick of the eye. And I thought, well, if I look there, it'll just be a shirt. I totally expected it to (laughs) be normal when I looked at it. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try it. And I looked and it was there. And I was shocked. And I was doing a happy dance at the same time. But I was so... (laughs) I was so like, wow, what is happening? So then I would look away. So I started to play around a little bit. So I'd look away and then I'd look back and it would stay. And that was the first time I ever remember seeing the energy with my eyes open like that. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we expect it to be so huge. Oh, yeah. Dramatic. (laughs) Dramatic. And Mm -hmm. look how subtle that was. And exactly. If you think about it, that probably happened a million times, but I just didn't notice. Right. And nobody told me to be on the lookout for that. So (laughs) I wasn't paying any attention. So isn't that weird? It is. And when you do Reiki, it sounds like the way I do. You're just, as you said, zoning out. And that's how I describe it too. I'm just sort of in the flow, kind of doing my thing just kind of allowing the energy to guide me so that I know what to do for the client's highest good. Mm -hmm. Every now and then it gives you a jolt. Like, whoa, what Mm -hmm. just happened? And uh, I had those kinds of situations too, not the way you described it, but you know, similar situations where you blink a couple of times and think, what, what's going on? Yes. (laughs) There is one I want to share because. Yes. A few years ago, for some reason, I don't know why, but it was great. Mother Earth would come into my sessions a lot. And I've written a few articles about that too, especially with this one client I had who was very connected to Mother Earth. She would always come in. And prior to that, I like didn't expect that. It wasn't like, I, hey, Mother Earth, come on in. No, I, I just right. didn't do that. But I knew it was her. It was that clear cognizance. And she's kind of like in my ear telling me things about my client. She needs to do this. She would be almost diagnostic, telling me what this client needed to do to improve her health. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, all right, and I'm writing notes, and I'm trying to channel Reiki and writing notes, and okay, okay. And I opened my eyes at one point, and I could see my hands. This really did freak me out, because my hands looked like branches, with little branches for the fingers. (laughs) Wow. I got chills again. 
I was looked at, I went, <gasps> I think I actually gasped. <laughs> and my client was out at that point. I think she was yep, right. asleep. I blinked and they were still there. <gasps> yeah. It was the oddest, really, it was kind of scary. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I, maybe I should turn on the light and make sure that that's not what's happening to my hands. <laughs> and I, I kind of said silently to Mother Earth, okay, I, I get the message. You're here. <laughs> Please. And I did say that. Like, I get it. You're here. All right. Then I blinked again and they were my hands again. But oh, it was no. like such a, it was like she hit me over the head with the fact that she was present. Right. How could I not know that after that? Right. Yeah. That was the strangest thing. <laughs> that is really cool. Yeah, I got goosebumps just when you said that. Mm. Well, at least in my story, my hands were still my Our hands. hands. <laughs> yeah. right? They didn't look like branches with weird little branchy fingers. <laughs> I know. Oh, no. I just love that because it's a reminder, isn't it? That we're just energy. Yeah. And energy moves and shifts and can appear in many different ways. Exactly. I think she was having fun with me, though. She was just like messing with me at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so cool. But I, I got the message. Poking a little fun at you with your with yeah, her with little, little branchy finger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. Speaking again, let's see, psychic Reiki and what happens in the treatment room. Don't you think probably one of the first things that ever happens with a Reiki practitioner that is intuitive will be that the practitioner goes to move to a new location, to move their hands from one place to another. And then they might feel like, oh, no, stay where you are. Yes. Uh huh. And they don't think that's guidance a lot of times. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. That is intuition working. Absolutely to help you offer exactly what the client needs for their highest good. Exactly. That is guidance. And and when they learn that, like, it is. It, I know. Like, oh, my gosh. I know. I love that. Yeah. So I think really early, that is one of the first manifestations of psychic guidance in a session. And then... Uh, I think it just blossoms from there, really. And so we've talked about a few, uh, you know, seeing with the eyes closed, seeing with the eyes open, hearing, knowing, sensing with the body. So all of those things can come in and help guide the session. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then the other thing, too. Now, I mentioned it in that way early example in the show with that student of mine. What about mediumship? What about visitors? Have you had experience with that that you could share? Visitors, yes. I mean, are you referring to angels and uh, spiritual entities or people who have crossed over or both? Both, I think. Yeah, I've had that happen. I can recall a couple instances where that happened and the client was able to easily identify the individual that I saw as someone who was close to her and had passed away. And that's always a little surprising too, that when I see someone that I don't know <laughs> in the room, that that was one of the times that I actually saw something with my human eyes and it was, you know, an older man slouched in a corner with his hat pulled down over his face. He looked like he was smoking a cigarette. It was a long time ago. I kind of forget, but he was just there. He never left. He was just kind of there in the corner. And when I talked to my client about it, she knew exactly who it was, like right down to the way he was dressed and his posture. And she said, I don't think he ever stood up straight in his entire life is what she said, because uh, he was very slouchy. So yeah, the short answer is yeah. And angels, I work with the angels a lot. Michael, he comes in. He, he's a big, he's a big swooper. He likes to come in with a big swoop and, and drama. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> Woohoo, I'm here. You know, that's great. I don't mind. But yeah, I I do. I get that. It happens a lot to me. And it's funny when you ask that question, I'm thinking, yeah, that happens a lot. And it made me realize, you know, how far I've come. It kind of brought it home to me, like, yeah, you know, you. You didn't used to do any of this stuff way back when, right? Right. So I know you've had visitors too, right? 
Yeah, I have. I remember one session where there was a gentleman right next to the table and he was actually the fiance of my client who had actually been murdered. Ooh. Uh, yeah, very suddenly. And it was a very emotional session, but he came and made his presence known. And I think that he did that. You know, he had a message for her, which I relayed, which that's a whole nother, whew, that's a whole nother dimension, I think, to a Reiki session. I think, too, it goes into the column of you can't predict how a Reiki session is ever going to unfold. No. And you can't prepare then. All you can do is be in the energy, follow the guidance for the highest good of the client. And and that's really about all you can do uh, because who knows what's going to happen. But this client, she was new. I didn't even know her. Anyway, he, he came, I think, too, because of his sudden passing. You know, it was so unexpected. And so he had some things he wanted to relay to her. And what a privilege it was for me to, number one, just witness that. But that's a session I'll never forget. And so much healing came from that. I don't have too many sessions that way with deceased loved ones coming, but it does happen from time to time. I think sometimes the information just comes without their presence being known. Right. It mm-hmm. kind of comes in in another way. And the other thing I think is weird, I'd like to well, and you had mentioned spirit guides and angels and things like that. And so, yes, I've also had that as well. But have you had the occasion of people who have not died, people who are still living, show up in a Reiki session? Yes, with a but. Okay. Usually it's in... I, I get a lot of past life information in my sessions, and I, it has a lot to do with my training as a past life therapist and all that. So that's something that I'm very tuned into. So I get a lot of past life information, not with every client, but I would say more often than not. So what will happen sometimes is someone will come in into my consciousness, and I know it's not me, it's somebody, it's spirit doing something. And I recognize what's happening as the soul of someone who's important to my client, but is still in body. It's not a past person, someone who is past. And I can just tell the difference. There's a different feel to it. And when I have sometimes uh, with regular clients, I will have past life information play out over time over with sequential sessions some of the people that are still alive in that client's current life keep coming in, but in their previous incarnation as part of this um, saga, if you will. So it's really interesting. So yeah, I do, but they're not who they are in this current life. They are who they were in a previous lifetime. So it can get a little confusing (laughs) trying to sort it all out. Yeah, that sounds like a series for Netflix or something. (laughs) Yeah, it could be. I can't imagine. So as the client, they're probably like, oh, I need to find out my next chapter. I need to. Pretty much. I had a client for years. That's what happened. It was like an old West past life. She was in the old West. And I referenced this in, in one of our very early podcast episodes. And every session she'd come in and she came in regularly and she was like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. <laughs> it yeah, was like it's watching like, a soap opera. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Like, oh, wow. It was wow. really funny. It just went on and on and on. She was able to recognize all the players in that soap opera, uh, for lack of a better term, as people who are part of her life today in obviously different configurations. And she she's very intuitive. So she also kind of, it's like we were on the same page. I mean, I could almost feel her response to what I was getting during the session. It was, it was very interactive. I always looked forward to her sessions. They were fun. (laughs) Oh yeah. You make such a great point. As Reiki practitioners, don't we just have the best seats? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) 
<laughs> Absolutely. Number one, we just meet the most fascinating people. And then yeah. number two, oh, the things we get to witness and talk about and see and experience. You just can't make this stuff up. You cannot. You cannot. And you you said it earlier. You said it's a privilege. And that's how mm-hmm. I feel. It's like such a privilege to be a part of that, you know, and an honor to be, like you said, to bear witness and to be present for some of these really remarkable moments in your client's life, right? And, you know, sometimes they're very emotional. I mean, I've I've had times when the client and I are both sobbing. It happens. But yeah, it really is a privilege. And as you said, we have that front row seat. You know, when I talk to clients prior to the session, I always say, and you said this earlier too, I always say, now, I can tell you that you're going to feel relaxed. And, you know, I kind of give them a little heads up, especially if they're new to Reiki, kind of give them a little idea. I said, however... (laughs) You got to expect the unexpected. Reiki is going to do what it's going to do. It's going to give you exactly what you need. I don't know what that is. And you don't know what that is either because we don't have access to that universal knowledge, right? I said, but expect the unexpected. And people go, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. You never know what's going to happen, which keeps it really interesting. It does. Yeah, I was just saying a couple of days ago in a Reiki class that I think that if we could predict it, and I think if we could quantify what every sensation meant, and oh, if I see purple, it equates to this meaning, if we could define Reiki and put it in a little box and it was predictable, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you about it today, Kathleen. I would have moved on a long time ago. Right. Yeah. That sounds deadly dull. Oh, yeah. Boring, dull been there, done that. And you know what? It just doesn't describe Reiki. No. Reiki is complex and mysterious and just immensely evolving all the time. Correct. It is. It is. Always, always, always. And if we allow it, it takes us along with it, which is just marvelous. Really? I know. It's a magic carpet ride. It truly is. We evolve and it helps us understand, become aware, not just of ourselves, but of our world, of of what's possible. It's as though we just keep surfing on that leading edge of understanding, you know? And I just find that so exciting. I do too. I know it it is it is truly one of the greatest gifts I've ever received, honestly. And it's the gift that keeps on giving, right? Yeah, totally, totally. Now, you know what? Before we go, let's talk about some tips that we can give the listeners. Tips on developing intuition. Uh, What would you say to that? Well, uh, as far as Reiki is concerned, I always say, first of all, self-Reiki. I mean, that to me is, that's just a given. You know, you have to do it. And it doesn't have to be an hour a day. Nobody has time for that. If you do, that's great. Take advantage of it. But even, you know, a few minutes in the morning, a few minutes at night, just sort of bringing it into your everyday life. But self Reiki is so important. Taking out a few minutes of every day to treat yourself, really give yourself some self love with the gold standard of self care, which is self Reiki. That's so important. Even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes at a time, I think Takata, Mrs. Takata said, Even a little Reiki is better than no Reiki. (laughs) And she's absolutely right. And then I also believe very strongly in inviting it into your daily life. And there are a myriad of ways in which you can do that. Just allow it to flow while you're going about your daily life, regardless of what you're doing, whether you're doing housework, you're at your desk, you're feeding the dog, you're making coffee, whatever. Allow Reiki to be with you. That helps to develop that relationship with their energy. And it also helps you to grow uh, spiritually as well as personally. And I think if you just bring it into your life, make it a part of who you are, you're going to see change in a way that you probably never expected. Yeah, that's great advice, Kathleen. And when you were talking, I was thinking about something that I think 
stands in the way of a lot of people of developing their intuition, and that's fear. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, we could list a whole bunch of fears. That's really not that important about what they are, but fears can stand in the way of people developing and trusting their intuition. And so when you advise them to develop their relationship with Reiki, well, what does Reiki do? It heals, it calms, it centers, right? And brings us into the present moment. And all of those things go to heal and alleviate fear. Exactly. To me, is just an obvious, wonderful way to approach developing intuition. And then I guess what I would add to that too is I really believe in a journal for writing things down because what'll happen a lot of times is we will be intuitive, but because we don't notice it or write it down, it just sort of washes away. And we don't recall that, oh yeah, I had a dream about that. And then it happened or, or whatever it is, or I knew that my father was going to call me this afternoon and the phone rang. And of course it was him, you know, got to put that in there. (laughs) Right. But what I mean is, you know, the universe is always calling us. Our guides are calling us. And when we're distracted, when we're not noticing, we're not noticing. The call is always there. And if we begin to write things down, it begins a cycle of us noticing more, of us being more aware of it. Because I'll bet you so many people listening to the show right now are much more intuitive, much more psychic than they even realize. I agree. Yeah. So keep a journal, write things down, and it helps create a flow of information. And not only that, your guides, the universe, whatever you want to call it, will notice that you're writing that stuff down. And guess what? They know you're listening. They know you're noticing. And they'll send more. So just keep on going with that and notice the synchronicities. Yeah, that's great advice. And I can personally attest to the value of keeping a Reiki journal. After I had my Reiki one class, I started keeping a journal. I would write every day in it. Anything that happened like in my life that I thought may have had, you know, any kind of meaning or whatever, it was kind of a lot of boring stuff. You know, but I was writing everything down and I did that for a year. And through that year, I had Reiki one, Reiki two, master, all, you know, a lot of stuff. And then I sort of fell away from it. But when I go back to that from time to time, I read that and I am just astonished at all the things that happened during that first year, which I would have long forgotten by now if I hadn't written them down. So that is excellent advice. Keep a journal. And now, because I, I'm more in, uh, in the 20, 21st century <laughs> than I used to be, <laughs> I put things on my phone because I get a lot of information at night. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll get something that comes in. So I grab my phone and I put it in my notes app. And I've started doing that a lot. And it's incredible the things that come in. And I know that if I didn't do that, And if I just kind of went back to sleep, I'd forget it. So keeping a record, whether it's in your phone or writing or whatever, that's excellent advice because it really allows you to track how you're doing. It does. And so much wisdom can come through. Oh, yeah. So much wisdom. And more and more people are tapping into that wisdom. If you just want to roll over and go back to sleep, oh, you're just leaving unearthed treasure then. Exactly. Exactly. You can almost see your spirit guides going, oh, you know, face palming. <laughs> right. Another opportunity going, is yep. gone. Just going you know? back to sleep again. You know? Oh, my. I can't believe we're, we've reached the end of our time already. <laughs> I know. I know. This is crazy. 
I had so much fun just talking to you this way today. I, me too. I love these episodes where it's just you and I sometimes. Me too. Me too. And we're just kind of coming at it really casually. We didn't really have an agenda, just kind of a topic. And we didn't know where we were going to go. Nope. Organic. Yeah. And I'd like to invite our listeners, if you enjoyed this and have questions about Psychic Reiki, whether it's our experiences or, you know, what do you want to hear more about? Reach out to us and let us know because, you know, we're making the show for you. So reach out and send us an email. You know where to find us, beyondthereikigateway.com and links in the show notes. But we want to hear from you so that we can carry on a conversation and include your interests, your thoughts, and what has your awareness lately. With that being said, thank you so much, Kathleen, for meeting me here. Thank you to the listeners. It's been fun, Andrea. I always enjoy it. And yes, thanks to our listeners. And we'll be back again with a new edition of Beyond the Ricky Gateway. We thank you again for joining us. And of course, we invite you to join us next time as we journey beyond the Reiki Gateway with Kathleen Johnson and Andrea Kennedy.